Welcome again, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science podcast. Today, we have a very special guest, my wonderful and beloved brother, Nathaniel Tinner. Nate has been somebody who has began in Protestantism, and we'll talk about that, and eventually made the move through Catholicism. But what I love about him is he didn't have some sort of narrow glancing. He really examined Christendom in a way that I think few people have. From the lowest of the low church, and that's a technical term, that's no shade, of the Anabaptists to one of the highest of the high, arguably, you know, one of the highest of the high churches, the Roman Catholic Church. And we have so many things to discuss, but a big thing is, you know, I had Armani Crawford on the, the Tuahado Bible study program and him and Nate are two of my brothers who back in my undergraduate days, we, we used to sit around and, you know, take our leisure time to think about God, to meditate on his word, to argue about, you know, theological matters, to look at scripture. And I, I think a large part of my own spiritual formation was aided and abetted by my relationship with the brother that y'all going to meet today. And so I'm for, forever grateful that I was able to get where I am today because, you know, one of the great commandments that he gave me was that commandment from Ice Cube, which was go to church. How you doing today, Nate? I'm doing pretty well. I think Ice Cube was, was on to something. Ludicrous, too. If you're scared, go to church. You know? So <laughs> get your behind in there. So why don't, why don't we rewind the clock? And like you're a, a comic book superhero, let's do your origin story. T tell us how you grew up in the faith. And I think one of the, the interesting things is you've done so much research on your own personal history as well, which I think a lot of people are either lazy or uninterested in pursuing that level of, of personal family research. I've done a lot on my own end too and have unearthed a crazy amount of information in my own way have become a family griot. And I think you are your own family griot in that way. So, so tell us about kind of the specific brand of Protestantism, or if it's more than one that you were raised in, but also the undercover Catholic roots that you discovered. Cause I think that's a beautiful story. It's funny that you mentioned, you mentioned that because this within the past three days, this random dude contacted me on ancestry.com. Uh, who's my cousin, because my parents both did DNA tests and I co-opted their results. And this <laughs> dude out of nowhere is like, hey, cuz, uh, get in touch with me because, you know, I have some family information or something. I thought this dude was wild, like, you know, 17th cousin really doesn't know anybody. This dude not only knows about my great, great grandparents that I didn't even, couldn't find anything on, he had pictures of them. So wow. I have new pictures of family members that I just found out about. Uh, and not just cousins, but like my great great grandparents. So, so it was like, good that we had the patient to uh, the patience to come to the the fullness of the time to get you on the show. I know you was a little salty that we was taking our our sweet time with it, but now now it you see that the be. fullness of the time. It was the time for the Lord to act. Yes, that's right. That's right. So, uh, so yeah, as I'm learning more about my my ancestry in general, I'm learning more about, you know, the kind of things that they did and the kinds of people that they were as well. But uh, I was raised in Southern Indiana. I was born by the river, the Ohio River, as a matter of fact. And uh, <clears throat> I was raised as a missionary Baptist, which is one of the many black Protestant denominations in the US. Um, <clears throat> and by raised, I mean, I was in it for age zero to maybe age seven. And then we went non-denominational for a while. And that was not at all a black church. That was a very <laughs> white church. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we were there for a couple of years. <clears throat> and now let me pause you there. When, when you, you know say what? that, were you the only black folks in that church or was like a tiny minority, like 20%, we, 5%? We were, like, we were not the only, and I do not know a percent. However, I can only think of two other black families at that church. Got and it. I remember them so vividly because I think they were literally the only other regular attendees there that were black. Um, maybe three other families, but um, yeah, we were there for a few years, and during those few years, my dad was not a pastor, whereas he had been an assistant pastor at the church that I 
was in for the first <clears throat> several years and of my missionary life. Missionary Baptist one. That's right. So he was a missionary Baptist preacher. Then he was on hiatus for a little bit. I think he had gone back to school to get his master's in social work around that time. And um, then he became a uh, Methodist pastor, United Methodist Church, but it was also a black church. It was in the inner city. He didn't move around like most Methodist pastors do. <clears throat> I think they made an exception because it was uh, a different demographic that is not as, I think, amenable to you know having a different pastor every couple of years. So he was pastor there for about a decade. And um, after he and my mother split, they started going to the different churches. So I was going to his church every two weeks and going to my mom's church every two weeks. And her church was a, an American Baptist church, which is the denomination that split off from the Southern Baptists over slavery way back in the day. So yeah. <clears throat> and were there liturgical differences? From what I understand, the Methodists are an offshoot more closely representing the Anglican church. And so I would imagine that they would be slightly higher church than the, the, your mom's uh, church that split off. I could be wrong. You're right about the history. And in general, they are slightly higher church than uh, surely black Protestantism. But in this case, it's probably even more slight than usual because we featured more traditions of black Protestantism than we did Methodism. Mm -hmm. Although we still retain some of those things as well. I remember we would light candles every Sunday, which is not something you do usually <laughs> on black, a black Baptist church. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And we had a set program, although I'm sure we deviated from it quite a bit. But um, yeah, there were definitely some Methodist elements, but it was still very much in the tradition of the Black Protestant Church. Um, and yeah, my mother's American Baptist Church was pretty much what you would see at a Southern Baptist Church. It was very country, but in its history and its tradition, uh, different from Southern Baptists. And uh, so that was my situation during high school <clears throat> and the end of middle school. And then I went off to college and was pretty settled in non-denominationalism for the next eight years, I believe, something like that. Um, yeah, and then after that, it was no more Protestantism for me. Well, well, let's go back. Let's go back for a second, yeah, because uh, when we met was in college, that undergraduate period you spoke of. And in that undergraduate period, I remember you used to say a line that used to baffle me and intrigue me because I've always had an appreciation for the Anabaptists and the, you know, the Mennonites, right? One of my favorite writers, Malcolm Gladwell, comes out of the Mennonite tradition. The Quakers come out of that Anabaptist tradition and their commitment to peace, um, although sometimes hypocritical where they would uh, fund militias to protect them, you know, there was still something underlying there that was interesting to me. I've even heard Dan Carlin's hardcore history about the original kind of factions in Germany uh, and it seems like there were some Waco moments with sieges where some Anabaptists were sieged and some of them were hyper militant. Some of them seem to be like Puritans, whereas others, you know, are more lighthearted like a Malcolm Gladwell and, and um, you know, maybe you would say progressive or, or liberal Christian in that way. But so you used to identify as part of that tradition. You say you were Anabaptist, but also reformed, right? And reformed, while it could be applied to all of Protestantism, usually meant um, Calvinist, right? And I think we both have an appreciation, for example, within the Calvinist tradition, generally speaking, Francis Chan, but maybe not so much for James White, who was, I think, popular for apologetics and, you know, arguing with Muslims, arguing with Orthodox, arguing with N.T. Wright and, and, and great figures like that on issues of like justification and, and so, so many, you know, random, Thing. So what did it mean to you to identify as a, a an Anabaptist Cal, Calvinist or Reformed person? Well, if I, I should preface it a little bit because <clears throat> I was not Calvinist for very long and I had not been Calvinist before college. So for the first 18 years of my Christian life, um, I probably wouldn't have even had a word for the theological system that I believed in because it just wasn't 
that wasn't systematic. the kind of product. Yeah. And it wasn't the kind of Protestantism that I had participated in up to that point. We were not reading systematic theology or any, mm -hmm. you know, academic theology kind of books. It was more pop evangelical Christianity. And as far as literature went, I don't think I could characterize Black Baptist necessarily that way. But yeah, when I got to college and encountered certain people and their views as Protestants, it was some of the first encounters I had had with Calvinism, Reformed theology, and with theology as a like academic discipline in general, or as a historic discipline. Like I just that's didn't... right. What was your tell the folks uh, your major? Uh, well, I switched to a religion to a theology major yeah. partway through because of those people. They had gotten me on to the, to mm -hmm. the idea of theology as something to be read about and studied mm -hmm. in addition to being believed in. <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, I hopped on board with that quick because it was like opening up the floodgates. Like I didn't yeah. know any of this stuff existed. And so I latched on to reformed theology, which made sense. Like I was Protestant. Why wouldn't I want to know more about, you know, the Protestant Reformation, the thing that created Protestantism. Um, and as I well, yeah, and, and, it, and it's I, important yeah. to say a lot of Protestants do not self-identify as the word Protestant. So you know, you yeah. you go back and say that it it kind of made sense, but I think for a lot of people, it doesn't make sense. A lot of right. people I, they're divorced from the protest that formed yeah. Protestantism. <laughs> for those first eighteen years of my life, I would not probably have called myself a Protestant, partially because I didn't know what that word really meant, and partially because I didn't care. Yeah, that's and and that part of that a historical nature. It's it's so fascinating. You know, I do my best to really get like the breadth of various political perspectives, and I'm very antithetical to Marxism. But there are a particular group of Marxists, one who passed away recently, Michael Brooks, who I think have some nuanced critiques where I agree with a, a number of their critiques, not necessarily what we would replace it with, but their critiques. And what's interesting is that there have been some Islamic, uh, Islamophobic people in the, in the media. And I mean that in a, in a genuine sense, and they focus on this abstraction of ideas in a vacuum while neglecting the sort of material concerns of these people, the foreign policies of certain governments and the um, the kind of actions that's surrounding it and the non-denominationalism that you described, a lot of these interesting strains of Protestantism, what I see is it's totally ahistorical. It does not, like you said, it does not look back and say, oh, we love, you know, um, we love Martin Luther. Uh, we love, you know, John Calvin. Like we love Zinguili and all these, these original thinkers. Like it's just only focused on the present moment and being in the present. And I think there's some beauty in the present moment, but I think a lot of the concerns that you and I are going to talk about go back to history. And I'm, I'm a person, I got to tell you that reformed theology was appealing to me too. I was born and raised in the Orthodox in a sense, like my parents are culturally Orthodox, but they've never been consistent attenders of church. They baptized me and my and my sisters, because our greater family w would have put too much pressure on them otherwise. Like they, they, they could have tried to take a bold stance against religion, but they're no blatant atheists either. Uh, right, you know, so right. they don't buy that side either. So you know, they go get along to get along with the with the larger family, with you know, very deeply religious brothers, sisters, cousins, and their parents. And so there's no getting around it. And I, I went to church, you know, once a month, probably from the time I was born till I was about 13. And I'd say from 13 onwards, I, I did stopped really consistently going to the Orthodox church for about a decade, but I was always going to random churches. So at, a Luth at my Lutheran middle school, there's a requirement to go to Lutheran chapel. So I went to Lutheran chapel every week and we participated in the hymns and the culture and studying Martin Luther and all that. In high school, we had this weird Northeastern, we had an independent school. So it's a weird Northeastern vibe where you have a, a provost who every six days would pray to a generic creator or nature's God, like the sort of deism of the constitution or the universal, uh, what is it called? The universalists or the Unitarian kind yeah, of the tradition. UUs. Yeah. Of the Northeast, right. That they kind of, they still want to 
call on, on some type of God's name. It's not totally blatantly atheist, but it's it's close enough. And in college, I met you, right? We we're, were at a church of Christ denomination church that again required us to have convocation, which is about 14 hours a semester, where you and it could be longer if you wait later in the semester, uh, where you listen to different people, you know, ex-porn stars, um, celebrities like Tia and Tamara, uh, whoever it may be, come and talk about how God has affected them. And then we had required New Testament study, Old Testament study, and a third course, which is voluntary, not including the major you're talking about. But to me, I think in that environment, the most intellectually rigorous people were the reformed people from what I saw. So I, I saw the allure there. It's my digging into history that led to otherwise. So what what I, I imagine it's your also historic assessment, but correct me where I'm wrong. What was it that began to sow the seeds of um, this might not be exactly what Jesus wanted for Christendom when you're amidst that group? It was, it was a lot of things, definitely a lot of things. But um, I guess when I latched on to reform theology and Calvinism, I envisioned it to result in a certain kind of thing for me and just generally for the kind for that church that I may be a part of like if we believe xyz things are the most important things and we you know act on that believe these things teach these things then our church should be you know ideal we should be out doing the things that you see in the bible for the most part but that are wasn't you, are you talking about like charismatic <clears throat> gifts or you no, talking well about yeah including that but Charismatic gifts, like going out and serving the poor a lot. Yeah, the charity, um, yeah. And if you read Acts a certain way, you know, sharing everything among each other, like actually being a community rather than a weekend activity. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't necessarily see that in Reformed churches. And generally speaking, I don't think that is the focus of Reformed churches because I think the most important thing to them tends to be um, coming to church and hearing the word of God taught <clears throat> on and, and let's focus on that. That goes back to the statement I said, the analysis I picked up from Michael Brooks and the majority report from these Marxists in critiquing the Islamophobes is that the group of new atheists, and what's funny is those Marxists are atheists too, but they're just softer in their atheism. They don't buy the, the whole new atheist school. And the reason they attack the new atheist school is that they focus on just ideas. I think the way the Reformed Church would speak about it is like doctrine, right? Where a lot of people speak about love, they would re-emphasize, they would emphasize and re-emphasize and say, well, love without doctrine is, you know, is foolishness. And I'd see different memes, like they were a memeing culture. So yes. that, that was another thing, you know, that draws the people to them, the, the humor, the attacking. And I think in many ways, it's very representative of the Western culture writ large, the emphasis on logic, reason, debate. Sometimes it's gendered and sometimes it's also about culture and being uh, a certain Western style. And interestingly enough, I think the Roman Catholic tradition, while clearly is what saved the West, they also have deep Eastern influences so that right, the Roman right. Catholic church is a blend of that. I recently mm -hmm. did a review of the documentary Bishop Robert Barron put out on St. Benedict. And when you look at St. Benedict, of all of all the various groups, and you could tell us about some of them because I'm interested in delving deeper. And I have a, another Ethiopian Orthodox friend who has a lot of experience. He, he's, he's spent even a year at a, a Catholic seminary before and has, has um, you know, deep connections with Roman Catholics in Ethiopia. And, and he's, he's opened my heart even more like, you know, I thought I was open-minded toward Catholicism, but he's opened my heart even even greater lengths to a lot of the the beauty within the Roman Catholic tradition. And from a lot of our discussions and discussions I've had with other people in independent research, it seems the Benedictines is really like a super Eastern thing. It's almost like a an Orthodox subculture within the Roman Catholic Church. Just looks like the way that they act, the the rule of prayer, and everything they do, like. It'd be you'd be hard pressed to find differences, um, to to be honest, unless you go into some of the deep like Christological uh, points, which I again think ninety nine plus percent of people would not even be able to 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 follow in the first place. So I think that idea of ideas or doctrine as separated from the material well being of people, like if you think about Jesus's salvation 
And if you profess it with your lips, uh, it doesn't matter. Like uh, I heard one person say, and this this actually shocked me. This is where I you know kind of stepped back from them. That charity or alms giving is kind of a bonus. It's not a necessity. That the most important thing are what your beliefs in your head are about Jesus, and yes. alms giving is like extra credit. Uh, yeah. So I don't know if that if that's what you were pointing to, but I had encountered that in my in my own kind of searchings. Well, when I was still Protestant, I wouldn't have termed it that way, but now that I'm Catholic, definitely that is that's what I'm realizing. Um, and that's also, it's funny, it's something that I've also been thinking about a lot this week. So that's another reason why it's good that, you know, we didn't have this encounter too early. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, when I was a Protestant, the issue was that I just didn't see what, you know, if we're solo scriptura, why am I not seeing what's in the scriptura happening, <laughs> happening in this church? Um, <clears throat> and that kind of, it didn't turn me away from Protestantism, but it turned me away from a certain kind of Protestantism. And that's how I got into the low church uh, and a Baptist house church kind of stuff, because that is by far what those people are known for is for forming communities and taking care of one another. Um, and just in such a radical way <clears throat> that it even got them in trouble during the Protestant Reformation, because they said, you know, if y'all not going to do it, we are. And that on top of their very unique views about baptism that kind of, you know, made them outcasts. But, you know, in the <clears throat> in the present world, for me, it was just, you know, a different kind of church. And that's what I was looking for. Um, and I, I had to, you know, dig for it because they're not common. They're not a dominant tradition in America. And yeah, that was a couple of years of my life just trying to find the right kind of Protestantism. And, uh, you know, being Catholic now, obviously that did not work out. That quest was- uh, Yeah, one of the funny uh, things you said during that quest to me that really cracked me up one day, I think I immediately called you when you texted me, was you said to me that everybody said they were anti-tradition. Like tradition is one of these demonized words. I think there are several words. Again, this whole ideas in a vacuum, over focus on doctrine, things like that, the scholasticism, it leads to taking words that are actually in the Bible, like religion, like, you know, religion versus Jesus, a false dichotomy that's nowhere in scripture, or the word like tradition, which is literally in the Bible in positive ways, right? As hand me downs or traditions. Uh, paradosis, if I'm not mistaken about the Greek, and okay, they would Alec. demonize, <laughs> and they would demonize these particular words. Um, so you said to me, you wrote to me one day that they are anti-tradition, but they have established a tradition of their own. What did you mean by that? Well, I think it's it's unavoidable in the Christian practice to establish a tradition and build upon it and stack things on top of one another to get where you are in the present. And Protestants claim that that's what's wrong with Catholicism, but it's obvious that they've done exactly the same thing over the past 500 years. And uh, it's the cognitive dissonance there is crazy, but I just, I couldn't help but to see it after I discovered it. It was, like I said, unavoidable. And um, any specific manifestations in case people are struggling with these uh, new traditions that they don't understand? Like, is there something you saw where it struck you or like, wow, that's them making their own tradition? Yeah, there were certain things and it's, it's difficult to, well, in American non-denominationalism, which is the context that I made all these observations in, there's a lot of things that are very similar across the board, like as far as uh, preaching being such a high emphasis, you know, having small groups outside of church. That's a, that's one thing. Uh, emphasis on personal Bible study, even the way that you receive communion at church, um, the frequency with which, with which you receive communion. Um, all of those things are, are traditions that have become very similar among non-denominational Protestants. Um, and how do you get to that point? How did this happen? Well, you can look at the history books and pretty much see um, which things happened where, where they became popular, how they became cemented. And then you have 
modern day Protestantism. A lot of people would like to think that, you know, the way we do things now is the way they did it in the first century. Like maybe not exactly, but even, you know, generally. Um, Pepperdine used to say it, that. They yeah, said yeah. our church began in 30 AD. 33, yeah, they are the, they are the one of the main denominations that re in that restorationist tradition that believes that their unique Protestant um, expression is somehow, you know, the most ancient. But I mean, A, it's just not accurate. And <laughs> I used B, to chuckle when I read that. I was like, word? I mean, word? it freaked me out. It freaked me out. I came to Pepperdine kind of ignorant of that that tradition believed those things so vociferously. But one of my first encounters at Pepperdine was with an African American guy who, you know, was was trying to lay that position out for me very forcefully. And I was oh, just like, this that's is hilarious. Bizarre. Same. Um, one one cornered me in the recreational center and he said, do you have the gift of tongues? And I said, no. And he says, then you are not saved. And I was go. like, I was like, I don't know what this man believes, but I don't believe what he believes. <laughs> I don't know what that is. I don't know which religion this is, but uh, I mean, yeah, even a tradition like that in Pentecostalism, the more uh, hard line forms of Pentecostalism, like how do you get to a belief like that kind of out of nowhere? Um, these are all traditions that developed uh, typically within the past 100, 200 years. And uh, it's fascinating that people believe that they really, those things really go back to the first century um, along with the rest of their denomination or churches uh, practices. Um, it, again, it's really fascinating. And once I saw it, I couldn't unsee it. And <laughs> it just kind of bit by bit broke down Protestantism for me, even as I, I, I couldn't even realize it as it was happening. I was just like, okay, I don't like this and I don't think it's biblical. So I'm going to go try to find this biblical thing somewhere else. And when I get there, I realize, you know, this also is not biblical and it's not fixing the problem. And yeah, eventually I came to the conclusion that even the most bare bones house church is itself a, a stacked tradition um, in the 21st century. That is like, we didn't get here just, you know, by chance um, people, you know, built that up and got to this point. And I also realized that in that tradition of house churches, new traditions are being formed, new uh, opinions and perspectives are being lifted up as authoritative by, you know, in a pretty much top down manner by individuals with power and influence who are very respected. And they say things ought to be one way, you know, many thousands or millions of people are gonna start doing it that way. And uh, that is tradition 101. <laughs> and I couldn't continue to be in a, in a, organization and institution that operated that way while at the same time swore up and down that it didn't operate that way. <laughs> so yeah, you, you became cognizant of the cognitive dissonance that you mentioned earlier. You might appreciate this analysis. One of my most watched videos on this channel, 8,000 plus is Curtis Yarvin. <laughs> Baby famous is Curtis Yarvin's. Uh, it's probably one of 10 interviews that he's like ever done. And, uh, you know, it's on this channel as well. The other ones are, you know, much higher. But anyway, this has a fair amount. And he, um, he and I talk about, you know, Ethiopia, pretty much the whole video. And from an internationalist perspective, his father was um, in Portugal and um, as a, a US kind of statesman. But in any event, he has this idea he's popularized. I'm sure you've come across it on the internet. So the whole red pill, blue pill thing obviously originates with the matrix. But the first person to quote unquote appropriate it was actually Curtis Yarvin. And he started the whole memeplex. And it, 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 it moved from him to both pickup artists as well as the so-called alt-right. And then, you know, to everybody what's, and their mom. What's um, a pickup artist? A pickup artist are people like uh, Neil Strauss is the most famous one. I read his book, The Game, actually, back in high school. And um, it has a lot of characters in there. There were reality TV shows about them, too. There's an Armenian guy who is pretty famous in that movement, and he just, like, repented of it all and became, um, I believe, either 
either Armenian Catholic or Armenian Orthodox. Uh, I think Orthodox, but he could be Armenian Catholic. I don't know the exact details. Neil Strauss himself, one of the most famous authors of that movement, has repented of his old books. But it's basically an um, – it treats the relationship of courtship between men and women like a game. And, you know, winning the game is basically who can be the most um, fornicatory or adulterous, right? And um, it, it gives people who would be considered on some people's scales, maybe a five or a six, let's say, as guys, the ability to regularly and consistently pick up dimes. And, and the way in which it purports to do that is by talking about certain techniques. Some of the ones that have sneaked into the popular culture the most are, for example, the idea of negging. And some people, you know, misinterpret what that means and to take it too far. But the idea that if you are in the presence of an overly attractive woman, for example, you cannot always flatter that woman because then she might be bored of you. That you need to occasionally make a negative comment or uh, a, like a scything joke. Uh, to kind of bring the ego down a little bit because everyone in her circumference or radius is typically flat, like launching almost without critically thinking compliments all the time and showering. Yeah, uh, another sense. popular idea that comes from that community is peacocking. So for example, Neil Strauss and another guy were like jugglers and magicians. And so doing kind of magic card acts at parties and clubs would draw people to you. Uh, wearing a ridiculous hat, having a feather in your cap, having a crazy mustache, um, shaving your head and having a particular goatee style. Like they literally had hypotheses and experimented on large amounts of women in Hollywood and in, and in other places. Kinda and then like they the wrote about that. this. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, Lord, it really was a game. <laughs> that's, and that's what they call it. Right. And, and so that, but that's one community and so this kind of understanding that not every human being is a blank slate, that cultural and biological um, influences are have some sort of relationship that is not weak to what we perceive and think to be our free will, so that you can say the same thing over and over again to different people, and it keeps working, right? Like there, there's something there, right? And it's it's not magic. So what is that? It's some. I think it's some level of uh, emotional intelligence. Um, at the same time, you know what you do with emotional intelligence is you know something God is going to judge you on. But in any event, Curtis Yarvin popularized the whole red pill blue pill thing, which is a memeplex that got spread worldwide to so many different groups. And his original red pill usage which was itself an appropriation from the matrix was that there is a cabal and this cabal is the secular protestantism which begins in the american revolution and the french revolution and the big thing that they want to overthrow is the ancien regime the old regime or the ancient regime and a big part of the ancien regime is catholicism louis the 16th's religion was catholicism before England split, you know, they had Catholicism too. And then, you know, they went into their Anglicanism, which was not that far, but still distant from that. And so that the whole idea of the American Revolution and the French revolutions, he sees as a revolt against Catholicism and, uh, you know, amongst, of course, monarchy as well, which came along with it, but that they didn't get rid of religion. What they did instead was they created their own cathedral. He calls it the cathedral. Yes. And the cathedral is actually a secular religious. It's, it's a religion itself. It's a secular religion. And although there's no explicit pope, it's decentralized, which is one of the central tenets of the Protestant revolution is that uh, F the pope, everybody's a pope, right? That's the, that's the thing, right? And, and yet, as decentralized as they are, when you examine all the major corporate media, the fourth branch of government or the fourth estate, as it was originally called in literature, and it, when you examine the, acad the major academic institutions, you know, the Ivy Leagues and, and, and Stanford and all these places, somehow 
they all have the same opinion. Is that magic? No, it's explainable and it's traceable. And I would say his original argument about the cathedral is exactly your argument also about what you saw in the tradition that is being raised by people who claim to be against tradition and that cognitive dissonance. And unsurprisingly, both the cathedral and both what you're talking about in the low church communities that in that are creating their own high church come from the Protestant Reformation. All of it. None of them are coming from Eastern Orthodoxy. None of them are coming so-called Eastern Orthodoxy, what I would call the Greeks or, or my branch, right? The Miaphysite or what you I would call the Afro-Asiatics, right? You know, so that that's interesting to me that that those and I just wanted to tell you that your analyses are the same. Now, let, let's uh, I want to give you open reign. Don't hold anything back. You got a chance. Um, can, and correct me if I'm wrong to enter, I think, the catechumen. Uh, so to actually explore, I think more than I think most people don't even look at it. Right. But you actually looked at and examined the Greek Orthodox and the Afro-Asiatic Orthodox, maybe less so the Afro-Asiatic, um, but but I think you did look at them and give me give me your appraisal of of these groups and, you know, ultimately what, what drew you into Catholicism and then we'll delve deeper into Black Catholicism. Yeah, so two Christmases ago, Christmas 2018, I visited a Byzantine Orthodox church uh, in the Russian Orthodox tradition, <clears throat> Orthodox Church in America, um, which originally was just their American, Russian Orthodox American mission. But since they've gotten autocephaly from the Russians, I believe. Because of communism, they were separated for 70 years and recommuned after. Okay. Thank you for that. Because I didn't know that. Yeah, um, it's the communist. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure the rest of the Orthodox communion does not recognize the OCA's autocephaly, but you know, that's all right. No combined. <laughs> I, I think they do. I'd be surprised. But I, I I've been to many OCA churches. I appreciate it. And tell us your first impressions too of like the liturgy, because there are funny historical moments. The way the Russians, for those who don't know, became Orthodox in the first place is in the nine hundreds, they had a czar who sent um his people all over the world and they said, We need we need a, a state religion. And he said, Examine everywhere. And they had one some people who were in um in Greece, what might be modern day actually Turkey now, right? The, yeah. the Hagia Sophia, yeah, so. the Holy Wisdom Parish. And uh, they said, we didn't, we weren't sure if we were on heaven or on earth. And they were like, we don't know what that was, but that was the closest thing to the heavens we've seen. So, you know, they came back and reported and he made Greek Orthodoxy. And that's why I refer to them as the Greeks, as opposed to the Greeks and the Slavs, because even the Slavs picked it up from the Greeks. They didn't pick it up from the Romans, uh, the Latins, right? Which Latin was a base language. They didn't pick it up from us Afro-Asiatics either. So um, the, the Slavs, and the, at the time they were using Slavonic as their language, they thought it was, you know, heaven on earth. So tell us your first impressions and, and yeah, and continue. Yeah, I don't know if I'd say it was heaven on earth, but it was definitely like few things I'd ever seen before. I had been to an Eastern Orthodox wedding previous to that, but I don't know that I was really paying attention at the wedding. <laughs> it was, that was the first the first taste I had. And it was just so unfamiliar that I just don't think I could even analyze it. And I don't think I did analyze it. But when I went on Christmas to this parish, my whole point was to analyze it. Like, I was like, I want to see what's going on in here. Um, Kenny so, did a report. Our brother Kenny B. Poppin did a report one time and he asked me to come to my church. I told him to come for the English service. And he's like, no, I insist. I must see the good service. I was like, boy, you don't know what you're getting yourself into. <laughs> and he came, he came late after I told him to. And then he, he stayed, I think for about 40, 45 minutes. And our service is like five hours long. So I told him you, you missed out on a lot. He said, man, for about 45 minutes, I felt like I was trapped in the twilight zone because an old man kept throwing smoke at me and they kept repeating the same line over and over again. And that was, that was his experience. Yeah. That's pretty, that's pretty much what I experienced at this, this, uh, OCA church. Uh, there was a lot of incense, which I was not familiar with. I don't think at the wedding there was quite as much and it was also a bigger, bigger space. Whereas this parish was quite small. So it's like really throwing smoke in your face. 
and <laughs> you know icons everywhere surrounding you like i don't know it, it it probably is a unique experience because the space was so small but like it feels like you are surrounded by what is going on did they have shoes no they just had like chairs smattered about yeah, definitely sorry, not I enough. I to, interrupted you. Go back to the surrounding. Well, yeah, you feel like you're surrounded, like by these icons. For one, the guy when they when they do the incense, they literally walk around the whole congregation, and so you're surrounded now by this incense. <laughs> and yeah, you yeah. just it, it was immersive. It was definitely immersive for me, despite the fact that I had no idea what was happening because. I was not familiar with any of the things they were saying or doing, and but it was in English, right? Because there are a lot of ethnic enclave parishes. Yes, this <laughs> OCA usually is in English, and this parish was. <clears throat> Matter of fact, shout out to Holy Trinity Orthodox Cathedral in San Francisco, California, on Green Street, y'all. Um, I owe them everything. So, <clears throat> yeah, it was very immersive. And also so confusing that I felt like I had to go talk to the to the pastor afterwards, which I did, and that kind of kind of got me on the journey. But um, yeah, I, because I came at it with such a different perspective than I had when I had gone to the Orthodox wedding, um, I felt like I had to know what was going on because I was kind of on the edge of Protestantism, as I said before. Like I felt like I couldn't be a part of that because of the claims that they were making were so obviously um, self-contradictory. And so I came to this, this church wanting to know what else was out there um, and just felt like I was getting the answer, but just not in a way that I could fully comprehend yet. I couldn't swallow it. And so I, I go to the priest and like, make this digestible for me. Like, can you tell me <laughs> everything? <laughs> and over the next couple of months he did. And really, of course, the things I wanted to know about were the things that Protestants don't do, that the Orthodox do, because that was what was so confusing. Why am I surrounded by icons? <laughs> Why is there incense? What exactly are you guys doing back there when you're, when they're in fact preparing, you know, the Eucharist? Like, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why is everybody crossing themselves, all this kneeling and I also asked them a ton of historical questions because growing up, the town I grew up in didn't have any Orthodox churches. They only had Protestant churches and Catholic churches. And I had a very negative view of Catholicism from a very young age. And I wanted to know where Orthodoxy fit into all that. Like, how, why were they not Catholic and why should that matter to me, a Protestant who's curious? And he was very, even keeled about it all. He wasn't polemic in any in any way. Uh, obviously he's Orthodox and committed to that, but at the same time he could point out nuances in the history, which was extremely helpful for me because I needed my views of Catholicism rehabilitated as much as I needed my views of Orthodoxy to be created and formed. So he kind of got me out of a lot of the radically a historical presumptions that I had that dated back to you know my upbringing in a <clears throat> pretty rural Protestant context. Not that my city was so rural, but their view of religion certainly was Christian religion. Yeah, you um, weren't too far from Gary, Indiana, home of Freddie Gibbs, Gangsta Gibbs, if I'm not I was mistaken. Very far from Gary, and I <laughs> hope that someday you and the rest of my friends will recognize that. <laughs> That is the opposite end of the state from Gary. Gary is not rural in any way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this this Orthodox Church was new, and the pastor kind of helped me get out of a lot of undo a lot of the propaganda that had kind of poisoned my view of Christian history and theology before I yeah. even knew it. Icons seems like something by itself that you would have been open to, but it was just different. But I think the process of which, you know, as Orthodox, we kiss icons, right? We call it greeting the icon. 
or hailing the icon. That I think that part, yeah, yeah. yeah, that part I think would have been offensive to you at the time. The sign of the cross is one of those interesting things too. I know some Ethiopian Protestants who the first Ethiopian Protestants, they were like against the sign of the cross. They were against wearing crosses, but then like their kids, like they love the sign of the cross. They love wearing Orthodox crosses. Like they don't think about that. Um, so I, I think those are more innocent things cause it's like generally in the culture and it, it doesn't seem like, you know, externally demonic to, to someone who doesn't know, but did you have any sort of initial thoughts on like the sign of the cross? Did you just think like it was unnecessary, but cool or what? I was pretty neutral on it. And really most of the things that happened in that service, I was neutral on nothing really offended me. And this is because I was so. I was so fed up with Protestantism at the time that I was just very open in general to what was going to happen in there. And so while I didn't understand a lot of things, nothing really offended me except for uh, <laughs> the part of the service where they say, uh, oh, Theotoko, save us. Save us. <laughs> Which I recalled from the wedding, the Eastern Orthodox wedding that I had gone to sometime before. Um, and that just, that threw me. <laughs> That was definitely one of the things I asked him about because that really did uh, make me think like you guys are doing something wrong. Whereas seeing the sign of the cross and seeing a bunch of pictures on the wall it doesn't necessarily make me think this is wrong. But you're going to have to explain to me why it's why why you do it, why it's right. So what I have to tell people, Nate already alluded to, we have a wonderful uh, black male chat group. Uh, a bunch of us were in that that educational formation together and as undergrads pursuing religious matters. And he's talking about how we roasted him about being close to the home of Gangsta Gibbs, which he says we are being inaccurate on, but close is of course a relative term. And in, in this regard, what's funny to me is I knew when you were studying orthodoxy and I knew the kind of vitriol that you had to the Roman Catholic tradition from a very young age. And so, your conversion, if it is called a conversion, I, I sometimes don't like that term in terms of, you know, moving from one branch of Christianity to another. It's not like you came from Islam or from Buddhism or something right, right. or Zoroastrianism. So, but your change, right? Your 180 degree turn, at least on the view of the Roman Catholic church is, is almost Pauline. You know what I'm saying? Like in terms of the zeal you had against the Roman Catholics and what you used to pronounce to where you are now. And I remember our friend group who found out about it before me, um, I believe you were in San Francisco at the time and you were vi visiting Los Angeles where a lot of us are. And um, their reaction to your change was probably the way some people reacted to the way Paul changed. Like it was aghast, it was fodder for humor and for all sorts of jokes, you know, for shooting at each other as we want to do in, in black American culture. And for me, I couldn't even fathom it. Like it wasn't even registering into my head. And then I saw around your arm, let me see if I have a, excuse me, let me get a prop out. Around your arm, I saw a rosary. And I said, this Did boy I really Catholic. Why really have one on my arm? Bro, you had it on your arm. Wow. At, because literally at the table when we were eating in a black Beverly Hills in Ladera Heights, hey. not too far uh, from my brother James's place, Santiago, um, they were accusing you of having become a Catholic. And I, the conversation wasn't registering in my brain. I was like, nah, like that's not even possible. And then I just kept staring at your arm and you had a rosary around your arm. And I was like, Nate, you Catholic? And you're like, yeah. <laughs> I, th to, I think you have to ask so you have been baptized. There's no way I was just walking around with that on my arm. <laughs> Bro, you are 100% because that's like, I remember it so vividly. Because literally the words were being exchanged the way you described it when you were at the Orthodox wedding, but I couldn't comprehend it. But for me, the kind of physical trinket around your arm was like, that spoke to me more than any of the words of our friends. So That's funny. <laughs> talk, That's to, funny. talk to us and, and bring, us, bring us into how, how you began giving a fair shake to the Roman Catholic tradition. 
Yeah, uh, once the once the Orthodox had me convinced, uh, in my view, it was it was a short jump, and the reason I was even considering it was because, you know, San Francisco is historically a very Catholic city, mm -hmm. and as it were, the name itself, yeah, as it were, almost all my friends there were Catholic, because my one friend from Pepperdine who lived there, still lives there, he was Catholic, so I kind of linked into his friend group. And so as soon as they heard I was considering orthodoxy, they were like, well, you know, we're right here. <laughs> and, you know, at the time I was like, no way. I still retained a lot of my anti-Catholicism, even as I was coming to accept more of their beliefs than I held before concerning, you know, Mary and the saints and liturgy and the Eucharist, those kinds of things. Um, but I felt like I wasn't, I wouldn't be doing my due diligence if I didn't give it a shot, which for me meant uh, attending some of their services as well and doing more reading about it. And I still, there was still so much I didn't know at the time. Uh, I mean, I didn't know much of anything about Catholicism still, even as I was learning about orthodoxy. <clears throat> but yeah, I started to do some reading. Uh, first book I read, concerning orthodoxy was called Rock and Sand, which is a book by Father Josiah Trenum. I believe he's located in- Riverside. So, yeah, Riverside, Southern California. And- uh, Bay's home parish. Oh, really? Um, so that, that pretty much ended Protestantism for me. Like whatever vestiges I was holding on to, that was gone. And the, But at the mm -hmm. same time, that book opened the door to Catholicism. I've seen him uh, talk about it. I've not read that book. I read his book on virginity and marriage, according to John Chrysostom. But yeah, he's he's an interesting figure within the church. Um, he has a lot of detractors and a lot of lovers. I've, I've been able to be edified by a lot of his work, so I appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, the book helped me a ton. And there were parts of it, you know, were probably bones that needed to be spit out. But um, overall, it was, it was very helpful to me. Um, and like I say, it opened the door to Catholicism for me because once a Western Christian, I think, ceases to be Protestant, Catholicism is obviously the big elephant in the room at that point, rather than orthodoxy. I think what attracted me still to orthodoxy at that point was that uniqueness, like it's not super common. Um, <clears throat> and it would make me, I don't know, I've always liked to be unique. So, you know, that, <laughs> that, that kept me on the Eastern Trail for, for a time, even as I was researching Catholicism. And uh, eventually the arguments about the papacy, the Pope convinced me that Catholicism was the way to go because I felt like the arguments against it from the Orthodox were insufficient, insufficient at least the way they were being presented to me. <clears throat> and from everything I could find in the literature, it was just like, these, these criticisms clearly come from an ancient perspective that does not apply anymore. And that was just, that was my understanding. And to some extent still is like the opposition to the papacy, the division between East and West in apostolic Christianity just is, is out of date. And I mean, Patriarch Bartholomew and the Pope have pretty much said so over and over during their respective Tenures, just like we're we're about ready to reunite. Like we we get the band it. back together. <laughs> yeah, it's like we we're dropping the excommunications. It's not like our beliefs are so opposed outside of the papacy itself. Like the I'll tell you is, an interesting tidbit: the Coptic Synod in Alexandria, right? So the genuine Church of Alexandria, because there is a some Greek folks out there too, but the indigenous church that are the descendants of Pharaoh. Um, and although they have a Greek script, their language is still pharaonic. Their chants are still pharaonic in melody. And the Golgotha hymn that they use uh, to bury Jesus on Good Friday is the same hymn that used to be used in terms of melody. Obviously the lyrics are different to bury the Pharaohs. So that tradition has said that they will not baptize any Catholic who wants to become a uh, Coptic. Amen. Whereas in the past, it used to be up to priestly discretion. At a synodal level, they made the decision 
that you you cannot the priest does not have the discretion you cannot rebaptize them which means basically that the sacraments are the same yes and that is that's the confession of catholics that you know all the eastern churches including the church of the east uh have valid sacraments and so like which is the most hilarious because that that's something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable and you respectfully call them the church of the east other people have different names that they call them <laughs> we don't we don't gotta get into all that because i can only imagine <laughs> uh but yeah the, there's just uh and that was one of the aspects as well not just the pope or maybe downstream of the pope is the unity of the catholic church the fact that they incorporate so much so freely and are able to say you know even to churches that are not in communion with them that their sacraments are still valid like without any reservations um to me that's beautiful and like they model what the church will be when it reunites because currently there is the western church the western catholic church and the eastern catholic churches um so like they've already started that process they already have tried to say you know even if, even if the churches are not fully reunited yet we're going to do what we can and allow those churches that want to be in communion to come in and still remain totally eastern I'll flesh out an example of what our brother Nathaniel is saying. And for the Ethiopian audience, you know, I could give you a practical example. Uh, I saw some people complaining recently because they were ignorant and they didn't realize what he's saying is, for example, the Catholic Church lets you retain a whole lot of your own traditions. And, you know, as long as you acknowledge the Pope is Pope, you, you could do a lot of things. You could have you, a lot. <laughs> you could have a lot of diversity. And so one of those examples that is a kind of general distinction and then i'll go to a specific one the general distinction for example as i understand and you could correct me where i'm wrong is that under the western right of the roman catholic church uh, if you want to be a priest you have to be you have to take a vow of celibacy whereas the eastern catholics who i think pejoratively used to be called uniates i, I think that term may be out yeah. of use i'm not sure largely uh, out of use yeah. largely out of use we're allowed to have married priests, including amongst that very diverse group, including like Ukrainians are Ethiopians. And in fact, the Ethiopian, the head of the Ethiopian Catholic Church, I think he's a, either a cardinal or an archbishop of sorts. He He's recently on TV with uh, even, you know, the bishop who ordained me, right? And and they were on TV praying together for the peace of Ethiopia. And And so when you look at their liturgy, What's so fascinating because you could see him and the other Catholic priests that were there, they knew the responses of the Orthodox Church. The reason they did is because they used the good is right. They yeah. used the rubrics. They changed some things up. They used a little less curtains. They might face a different direction. It's not necessarily facing the east or face the west, maybe, you know, but the main rubrics are the same. And so I remember some Orthodox folks were getting shocked online because they didn't know about this. I've been knowing about it for years, but that's one of the ways in which the Roman Catholic Church allows diversity. So you're saying that diversity drew you. And one of the things about that diversity is it allowed black expression in America, in the American context. So why don't you tell us, because you, you talked about it earlier in terms of how you switched from a black missionary Baptist church to a non-denominational white church. Tell me about the Orthodox, which, you know, depending on how you define, you know, whiteness, you know, Russian may or may not fit into that, but you were in, I, I think what a lot of people would say was a predominantly white community, but you occasionally saw some black folks there too, who happen to usually be my folks. So tell me a, a little bit about kind of the black tradition within orthodoxy you encountered and then how how you saw the black american experience within catholicism yeah so there were some eritrean orthodox folks who who showed up one sunday to the oca church which was bizarre to me because all this reading i'm doing said that that's, that, that's not a thing <laughs> uh, and at first i didn't know they're eritrean orthodox i just saw them and was like, okay, they're just- You said they uh, got some melanin over there, them folks. Yeah, African people, black people uh, that happen to be Orthodox. Okay, cool. Come to find out afterwards that their weekly, the OCA church's weekly feast after the liturgy, that these people are in fact not 
Eastern Orthodox, they're Oriental Orthodox, Eritrean Orthodox folks. And I'm like, y'all aren't even in communion, are you? And I asked that because they had communed. <laughs> and, I, and this is the seat of the bishop of the, of the OCA Diocese of the West. And so I'm talking to the pastor, like, what is going on here? I don't even know if he's the one that told me. It may have been the choir director that told me. He's like, yeah, they're Eritrean. Uh, they have a long, long relationship with that parish going back to before there was an Eritrean parish in the city. And so they come from time to time, worship, and the bishop has given them permission to commune, receive the Eucharist. And then they cook for them. They cook for that church a meal afterwards. And it was the first time I ever had Eritrean food. And I was like, okay, food's good. The, the communion's good. And, you know, I like, I like what this is saying. And that was still before I even had come to a decision about Catholicism, which has for a long time practiced that same kind of thing. Like any, any Eastern Christian that wants to commune in a Catholic church is allowed by the Catholic church to do so, usually not allowed by their own Orthodox jurisdiction. But, um, but yeah, that kind of openness really encouraged me as a Protestant who was used to kind of like these walled off little uh, denominations and non-denominational denominations called <laughs> non-denominational churches. <laughs> and yeah, I just, I was done with the non-conformist was, conformist club. Yeah, it, it was wild, but um, I was glad to see the opposite taking place in both the Orthodox uh, parish that I was at and in the Catholic, Catholic, uh, Catholic tradition uh, in general. And so <clears throat> eventually I started to attend an Eastern Catholic church in town, which happened to be down the street from where I lived. Ukrainians and, or a different group? No, same uh, same right as the Orthodox Church I was attending, so Byzantine Catholic. Um, and like you were saying, the the Gaz liturgy is the same, more or less, between Catholics and Orthodox, and <clears throat> the Byzantine liturgy is more or less the same between Orthodox and Eastern Catholics, Byzantine mm -hmm. Catholics. Yeah, I've seen a Lebanese version of the Byzantine. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. And I was, you know, living in that universality that I was happy to see in the Catholic Church. And I started to read more about American Catholicism, which, of course, intersects with African Americans. And so that, that helped cement my, I, my intellectual acceptance of Catholicism was complete. But that was the point where I felt like I could feel at home in the Catholic Church because <clears throat> not only did they have the right theology, in my opinion, but they also had um, created space for the Black experience and expression. And I learned this first in a book called Authentically Black and Truly Catholic by Matthew Kressler. And uh, Authentically Black and Truly Catholic is actually a quote from a lady, Sister Thea Bowman, who's, I believe, been declared servant of God in the Catholic Church, so she's on, Which is on the road to canonization. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, Catholics have a very a... formal canonization process. We have a notoriously chaotic one. I can tell <laughs> you I'm a very high-ranking teacher, probably the top English teacher in Southern California in our diocese, and I have no idea how one becomes canonized. Well, I think you're on the way yourself. So whatever you're doing, <laughs> everybody emulate Hinoke and you'll get there someday. Um, but yeah, so this book, Talks about authentically the, black, truly authentically Catholic. black and truly Catholic. Yes, a quote from Sister Thea Bowman, and the book itself is about the Catholic history in Chicago, Black Catholic history in Chicago, about how after the Great Migration, many Black people became Catholic in Chicago. And I tell for sorry to be so, uh, <laughs> you know, democratizing, but I try to pretend that some people don't know what that means. Can you tell folks what the Great Migration is? Obviously, you and I know. Yeah, so when, when stuff got really hot in the South and black people were getting, you know, openly blasted after, uh, during the Jim Crow era, a lot of black people got fed up and just left the South and went to various other places, California, <clears throat> New York, Chicago, various places in the North where they didn't, where, where they expected to be treated a little bit better and they were treated a little bit better. Um, and was your family any, was that, true of your family or were they originally in the North or were y'all part of the great migration? I, I don't think so. My mother's family is from the North, 
Kentucky. Well, Kentucky's not the north, but it's the north and south. <laughs> <laughs> and I grew up in southern Indiana, like so that was very close. My father's yeah. family's from Mississippi. His mother moved to my hometown when in the '60s. So I think that was maybe the latter end of the Great Migration. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, so people went north looking for greener pastures. Chicago is one of the places where they ended up. A lot of people became, a lot of black people became Catholic in Chicago, which was very Irish and Catholic. Um, and Italian, the Italians and the yes. Irish. Mm-hmm. And so. Who who I would jump in just to say, because I want to ask you to compare later on. I think the way in which, you know, John F. Kennedy, first Catholic president, a lot of people now forget, like that was a very big thing that had not happened. The WASP culture, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture was dominant. So John mm-hmm. F. Kennedy being the first Catholic president, very big, also not surprising that he was assassinated. We can get into, you know, in another day, everything surrounding that. But isn't it weird that the first Catholic president gets uh, assassinated? Um, so his family's Irish, right? And the Irish and the Italians are the first groups of people, notably by scientific racists, originally called Negroes, along with the Jews, which I think is very interesting. And uh, these groups of people, the Italians and the Irish, who eventually simulated with the WASP culture, for the most part, although they re- retain some distinctions, um, are later joined after the issue mainly with World War II with America and Japan over the Philippines, by Filipino immigrants who even nowadays I've heard in, in especially in Canada that certain Filipinos have begun um, kind of joining in and taking over things that were formerly Irish or Italian churches when the church attendance reduces, but the newer Filipino immigrants are a little bit more pious externally in their Catholicism. So those are the three major groups I know about who are Catholic, but you're telling us now that the the blacks who moved there in the great migration mm-hmm. were adopting primarily from these Irish and Italian folks, the Catholicism. Uh, and, and yes, and the Catholic church was very I don't know, very, but at least somewhat proactive about, you know, trying to bring these folks in. They're like, oh, com- convert, uh, possible converts. And so they started scraping the barrel to try to get them in the door. And it was kind of like what you just described with the Filipinos, that as white people faded out of those parishes, black people took them over. Now, granted, white people were fading out for a different reason, because probably in Canada, uh, they're fading out just due to irreligiosity. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Chicago, they were not becoming less religious, they just hated black people. So they were <laughs> they were cutting trails out of those neighborhoods that black people were moving into. And so these Catholic churches became black they churches. They didn't want to swim in the same pool. Oh yeah, absolutely. These these parishes became black parishes almost overnight. And so this new form of black Catholicism started to emerge. And it's funny you mentioned JFK because after he was killed and then you know several years after the black situation in America got progressively worse because Lyndon was just, Lyndon B. Johnson was just not not really about it when it came to black people. That man was a gangster. <laughs> yeah, it was ugly. And so MLK got killed soon after JFK and stuff got really hot in Chicago and all over the country. There were riots and all of this. And black Catholics in Chicago who had kind of started to come into their own, became sort of radicalized as part of the Black Power movement. And as part of trying to create this more authentic Blackness within the Black Catholic experience, which hadn't really been a thing before that. Um, were, not they to say adop- that- were they just adopting the exact like kind of um, molding of the Irish churches, the parishes they were taking over prior to the establishment of a more authentic Blackness? Yeah, um, because for them, that was Catholicism. It wasn't necessarily European Catholicism. Uh, it was just Catholicism. Mm-hmm. And really, that's all the only expressions that existed here at the time in America. So Black Power kind of shut that down quick, where they were like, this is not, this doesn't even belong to us. And if we're going to stick around in the Catholic Church, it's going to be on our terms and with the kind of things that we do. And this was about a decade and a half, two decades after Vatican II, which had kind of opened the door for that kind of expression to occur. And so they ran with it, Black Catholics in Chicago and certain priests like Father George Clements uh, ran with that. 
and they started to integrate African, Afrocentric and African-American traditions into the Catholic church, um, often by force, because some of the bishops, especially there in Chicago, were not having it, just like, I, I yeah, remember, what what does that look like for us? One of the things I immediately think about is like, I would think it would be odd for a bunch of black folks from the South to move North and just all start speaking Latin. So I imagine language has some role, but I know you've told me before off the record that, you know, it's not necessarily the, the language, which was the biggest barrier, but I, I do think that must be something. And if you could in any way relate that to some of your friends, because as I understand it, a lot of your friends were that originally got you into Catholicism were kind of stands for the TLM and Latin in general and traditionalists yes. and at least, at least let's say biting their tongue, if not openly opposed to Vatican II and some of yes. those changes. That's, that's very accurate. And it's a, uh, it's a fascinating experience to be having in 2018 and 2019 when I was having it because you know that's many years and many decades removed from Vatican II, yet we're still having that same conversation in some parts of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> Whereas back in the late 60s, it was a different kind of conversation because some people had sought out Catholicism for that very reason, because black people, I mean. Because, because was, of Vatican II, they, they, well, because no, they no, liked they, Vatican II or why? They Catholicism for the traditional aspect, for the Latin, oh, okay. for the high church yes. aspect, because that didn't exist in Black Protestantism for the most yes. part. And so they had sought out Catholicism for something that changed almost immediately. And so <laughs> within a couple of decades of them becoming Catholic, Catholicism was now able to become something else entirely. And so the transformation from a traditional black Catholicism to a black power, black Catholicism was not necessarily accepted across the board. And it was very complicated. What type Chicago, of changes like, were they making to Catholicism? Like what, what was different about these parishes? Um, well, as, once they started having these things called black unity masses, which were basically the first experiments with Afrocentric Catholic masses, Mm -hmm. They would use vestments that reflected uh, what African-Americans kind of stereotypically viewed as African. So they would wear maybe like tiger skin. Mm -hmm. I read about there's one, one mass that involved tiger skin vestments, uh, spears, the African face masks, and like the, oh. the, the cloth over the table would be like with African, maybe uh, kente colored stuff. Mm -hmm. Kente cloth in general were something that started to be worn. Democrats were bowing and wearing around themselves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can't even speak on that right now. But, uh, <laughs> and they would obviously a black Jesus would start to appear in these churches. And Mandatory. notably, incident, a statue of St. Anthony of Padua, who's very much not a black Catholic saint, was removed from one parish and replaced with a shrine to Martin Luther King Jr. Ooh. who is not Catholic yeah. and, you know, probably does not meet the qualifications for sainthood with which Catholics are most familiar, like being this, you know, super pious, perhaps uh, kind of quiet, uh, you know, he's not that. So <laughs> the bishop said, absolutely not. This is Archbishop Cody, I believe, in Chicago. He was like, absolutely not. You need to bring St. Saint, Saint Anthony back where he is, put Tony back where he belongs. The pastor there, Father George Clements said, <laughs> not only said no, but he said, why don't you try to come do it yourself? And if you do, I'm not gonna be able to protect you. And the context behind that is that Father George Clements was very good friends with uh, the Black Panthers. And the Black Panthers had been kind of providing uh, security at some of these radical Black Catholic events that were starting to pop up. And so, yeah, he said, if you if you wanted to if you want uh, Saint Anthony back in here, you're gonna have to do it yourself, and it could get ugly. And that statue was was not removed by by Archbishop <laughs> Cody. <laughs> that shrine to MLK remains. Some gangsterism, Perhaps, some gangsterism yeah, in the church. <laughs> hey, uh, it might have it was probably gangster before it was Italians. <laughs> so rival gang. <laughs> A little bit. And uh, so, yeah, that movement kind of grew to a nationwide thing. 
gospel choirs started to appear in Catholic churches. Um, and really African-Americans in general felt free to express what they saw to be a more authentic blackness in their Catholic churches and in their Catholic liturgies. And that has endured to the present day. <clears throat> it, it's interesting that you mentioned, you know, like the face masks, right? Because as an African who has had, you know, Christianity for quite a while, you know, I am often able to see things in in my general Ethiopian culture, and I'm, I think, better than most at this, recognizing like three categories of things, right? The one thing is like a purely Christian thing. The one thing is like something that looks like it was pagan at one point, but they baptized it. And then the other thing is like, that thing is pagan and it was never baptized. Like that thing is still pagan. <laughs> like it's crazy. I was joking. We have a, a, a celebration called the finding of the true cross. I don't know if it's in Roman Catholicism as well. And it's uh, around September and we have this giant like bonfire and people try to pretend like they ain't no pagan origins to a giant bonfire and a bunch of Africans dancing around it and singing. But we, we've, I, I would argue successfully baptized that holiday, you know, whatever it originally was because of everything, everything that is the focus of that day is the cross, you know, but there are other things that people do that's just like straight up pagan. And I would want to know, like, it seems like in general, you, you are a fan of the way in which the church began to be inclusive of diversity of practice. I imagine though, that there are some sorts of logical limits to what you view as that. So I would like to hear from you what you think the boundaries of inclusion should be. And, you know, if that's something coherent to think about or say, and, you know, where does the exclusion, like, where do we need to put the foot down on, on exclusion? You know, some of the ridiculous examples, I don't know how, how common it is that I've seen people post because I'm I'm in Catholic Twitter too because Orthodox Twitter ain't that big so I like to lurk on Catholic Twitter too but the 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 clown the clown masses is how some people kind of memeify it right so talk to me about clown masses talk to me about what the masks actually reminded me of were the debates people were having about some of the indigenous communities in South America and how the Roman Catholic Church was um, permiss permitting some level of inclusion that was making at least some subgroup i have no how idea how big and maybe twitter is inflating how big they are but really inflamed and and even making accusations of idolatry in terms of the level of inclusion that was being permitted i will say this i don't think i've ever seen anything in black catholicism that um you know, I, as soon as the words start to come out of my mouth, I realize it's not true. Rarely <laughs> have I ever seen in Black Catholicism that I felt went too far. And part of that is because I think most Black Christian traditions that Catholicism adopted in the late 60s and onward had already been refined in Black Protestantism for hundreds of years. <clears throat> and so, a lot of stuff had probably been scraped away by then. And, you know, as you said, baptized pretty sufficiently already. So there was very little that was brought in raw into Black Catholicism that still needed, you know, some kind of vetting. Mm -hmm. Though many still wish to vet it and reject certain things. About yeah, you paused it. yourself. What were you thinking of? It's okay if you don't want to share. But. <laughs> I participated in some Black Catholic ceremonies that we're trying to integrate modern black culture in a way that was just, it was doing too much. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, there's a part of the Catholic mass where we recite the prayers of the faithful and the congregation has a response. And at this mass, the response was, Holy Spirit, burn, baby, burn, something like that. I, they definitely said burn, baby, burn. And then the relationship was with the Holy Spirit. I don't know exactly what <laughs> the wording was. And so Maybe was close like, to uh, the post-Christian fake Rick Ross Rosé when he would say the Holy Spirit inspired him to murder people. <laughs> I mean, it's the line is so thin in a way. 
Like, especially with the Holy Spirit, back with our brother Armani, who I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things we used to discuss in our, our focus group back in uh, undergraduate was this verse in Matthew 12 that I, I recently recorded for an audio Bible that I'm, I'm working on. And the verse is that if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you will not be forgiven. But if you blaspheme the Son, you will. And we, we looked at the message. I remember we looked at the Hawaiian pigeon version. We looked at the, the message version. And uh, the, the, the message version said, you're dancing on the branch. And so one of our inside jokes throughout the years, Armani used to be like, boy, don't dance on that branch. Don't do it. Don't, cannot do it. But, but yeah, you can't play around with the spirit. In general, you can't play around with the mass. So I do feel like it can, it can go too far. And part of, part of uh, the enculturation of the mass is integrating, you know, black ways of speaking, but, you know, it, you can't get cute with it. Like, it's just not necessary. Like, and there have been those few, select few times where I've seen some things where it's just like, no, this is, it's unnecessary. <clears throat> like I said, that's rare. It does not at all characterize black Catholic liturgy. Um, and clown masses, as, as far as I know, are, extremely rare to the point of non-existence and is not something that should be even talked about among Catholics because it's it's more of a trope that's brought up by people who 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 underneath that have this view of the church that is very segmented and even Protestant like whereas they feel like they can reject certain things that the Pope and the church decide simply because they disagree with them as, as right. lay and, people. And, let, and let's clarify that in the conversation we were talking about earlier, I, and you could correct me where I'm wrong. I believe what our brother Nate is saying is that while these people are in the Catholic church, the most Catholic thing from everything that we've discussed is respecting the authority of the magistrate and of the Pope. And I see this sometimes in the Orthodox church too. We have some people who think not only am I more orthodox than thou, but I'm more orthodox than the Pope, which is wild. And so while they remain um, and they opine on ideas, again, ideas divorced, like ideas in a vacuum, divorced from the grounded reality, divorced from the authority of the church, of the, of the council of bishops. So their ideas, they believe to be truer, more Catholic, than the Pope, but in reality, what you're calling Protestant is not necessarily their ideas because you wouldn't find Protestants that would like their ideas, but that the way in which they go against authority is, yes, I believe, what you're the, calling the Protestant. System, the system of thinking, the willingness to reject legitimate Catholic authority and decision-making simply because one, as a layperson, disagrees, or as a non-bishop, a non-Pope, it's like, what you say is your opinion. Whereas when the Pope or the church make an authoritative decision, it's not an opinion for the Catholic church. That is now our, <clears throat> our law, it's what we believe. And obviously there's a lot of nuance to be had there. Not everything that the Pope says is meant to be an authoritative decision for the church, but there is a segment of the church that loves the Latin mass that also rejects things that are not allowed to be rejected. And uh, yeah, that's obviously extremely problematic. And mm -hmm. as mentioned previously, there is a segment of the church today um, that believes those kinds of things about Vatican II and about the the way the new way of doing the mass since the fifties and sixties, which includes uh, the Novus Ordo. Yeah, yeah, the Novus Ordo, which is what the Black Catholic liturgy is. It's a form of the Novus Ordo. Novus Ordo. And so a lot of people today who are more traditionalist and <clears throat> don't have a friendly relationship with Vatican II and the Novus Ordo often reject Black Catholic liturgy for that reason. And it's like... Yeah, a music. misnomer I had, um, and I try to study these things, you know, as neutrally as I can too. A misnomer I had was somehow that the TLM, right, um, the traditional Latin mass was somehow longer. And one of the interesting corrections I received from my brother Nathaniel is that the way in which, and I'll let him say it in his own words, but that black people are performing the Novus Ordo 
maybe differently than other groups would perform the Novus Ordo does not bear out that it's even shorter in length than the others. Although the words may be shorter, maybe the way the runs are in their voice and everything is different. So you put it the way you want to put it, but uh, make yeah, that I mean, statement for us. Black, service, black church services are long, period. Whether it's Protestant or Catholic, like they're just long. Or orthodox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you said, you got a five hour service. We got a two or three hour one, solid. And uh, that's partially because we like we love to sing. We love to sing longer songs. We love to preach longer sermons. Um, and we have a longer sign of peace, as we call it, where like usually people would just turn and literally give the peace sign to people and say, peace be with you. Like a lot of black Catholic churches will literally have people walk around, hug and kiss and chat with their neighbors, say, how you doing? I have a fun, uh, we have the, that's a, one of the debates I've seen on Twitter as well between Catholics. And I find it funny because we have that in our liturgy as well. And even within our communion, it's, it's different, right? So the Ethiopians, the way we do it, it's like a, like a Japanese or like a martial arts bow. Like we, we kind of like face all four directions to represent like the gospel in every direction. And we kind of just bow in the direction of people, but not like directly at anybody, just in the four directions. And you kind of make eye contact with people during that, but you don't really like touch anyone. In the Coptic tradition, they take two of their hands and they touch your two hands and then you both kiss your two hands. So while we conduct the Giz liturgy, me and some of the other deacons, you know, our bishop has, has seen us do it and he smiled, but he's never like corrected us. So we're, we're allowed to do it as far as I know. But in the midst of the Giz right liturgy, we'll do the Coptic uh, uh, sign of peace. <laughs> and just because this is like different. <laughs> yeah, I've experienced in a, a Maronite church, a Lebanese Catholic church their sign of peace, they kind of pass it with the hands as well. They don't kiss, I don't think, but they, you know, just pass it like this, which is very, it was very interesting to me. It was the first time I'd ever seen that. And that was before I'd even uh, been confirmed in the church. So I was still, I was still learning at that point. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of diversity in the different forms, even of the Nov Novus Ordo. And uh, the Latin mass can often be quite short because the prayers said by the priest are not usually audible and are often just rapid fire Latin, just da 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 Whereas in a black Catholic Novus Ordo liturgy, pretty much everything is audible. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, it's the Novus Ordo is a lot about audience participation. I shouldn't say audience, but congregational participation. Mm -hmm. And that just bears out to a longer service, especially in black Catholic parishes. And uh, so let's also bring it back while we're speaking of this diversity of practice within Catholicism, the whole debacle about the indigenous Catholic communities. I thought you had a, a nuanced point of view on that, which helped me form, you know, my own thoughts. You're referring to the, to the Amazon Synod and all that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're, like in America, there's this traditionalist wing. There's also the same kind of wing in the in Brazil, Brazilian Catholicism, I encountered some of those individuals who I did not previously know existed before the Synod, and they definitely have a uh, restrictive view of what should be allowed in the liturgy. And granted, the enculturation happening in the Amazon is much newer than some of the other enculturation processes in the church. So <clears throat> they, um, at the Amazon Center, they had a couple of different liturgies, one of which was notorious for the statue that was given to the Pope, said to be said by the person who gave it to him to be representing the Virgin Mary, whereas everyone pounced upon it as being totally pagan because originally it obviously was something else. And I think, and I don't think this is actually the, <laughs> the conversation that we had previously, but I think because their enculturation process is rather young, and is still in a phase and context where they don't have very much, many resources or priests or oversight probably. Um, there's obviously much more, uh, you're gonna see a lot of more things that are easier to criticize. I don't know that they're necessarily in reality more loose or more worthy of criticism, but just looking at them without any context, certainly there's more things that you would say, what is actually going on here? 
And They're subject to more eyeballs than the early periods of Catholicism everywhere else. And uh, black, black culturation didn't happen visible on Twitter, for example. Exactly. And and you even defined the Protestant forms of establishing a black culture in the United States as a form of a refining fire itself, of of ridding the kind of bad elements over time. And so I think you're saying a long view of these people, they may be wrong on this particular idol, but a, a, a long view of them with maybe less eyeballs and less pressure and less demanding of immediate purity might allow them to kind of, you know, take care and locally organize themselves into an authentic Amazonianness while being truly Catholic. Absolutely. And that's pretty much what the Pope said in his letter to them after the Senate was like, you guys can figure this out. And we're not going to, we as the church are not going to, not going to stop you. We need to, I, th I would say, I would characterize it as him saying the church needs to work more on openness than the Amazonians need to work on orthodoxy. Because the people calling their orthodoxy into question typically are people that had no idea what they were talking about. I think I think you and I in general are far more interested in religion and culture than politics per se, but I think you and I are similar gadflies in that we have been indiscriminate in our critiques of all the presidents of our lifetimes and the various politicians. And you put me onto something very interesting. Now you're no longer in the West Coast, you're back in the South in the wonderful Nolens. And that is a, a proud Catholic area as well. Y you've said something to me that I've known because I've studied politics. You know, um, it's not that I don't have a politics; it's that it's it's less electoral. But speaking of the kind of electoral politics and the 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 kind of changing demographics of the various regions, right? You've been in the Midwest, you've been in the West Coast in two major cities, and now you're you're back in the South somewhere you, you've been before as well. Can you tell us like what basically makes these, because uh, I, ha I have this theory, right? I have this theory that people who are generally progressive but have to live and confront conservatives on a daily basis as opposed to totally isolating them get a more nuanced view of things that i think is closer to home to where i am and so there's a, a writer uh god i'm forgetting her name right now i'm so i feel so bad of religion at the atlantic and she grew up i believe in nashville and so while she may be generally progressive and uh, may not quite profess religion in the way that that some people would want her to. I think she has some of the most nuanced views of religion by virtue of the fact that she has to go to the grocery store with people. You know, you can't demonize humans when you're living in close proximity with them. I take Jack from Twitter to be that way. Some conservatives try to drive into him as if he's, you know, the Nero against uh, conservatives. But for me, I think he's a super nuanced progressive dude. He's progressive, but he's super nuanced and because he grew up in Missouri. His family is conservative. The people who grew around was conservative. So when I hear him talk about politics, it's not quite the bi-coastal liberal elite way of saying things that that really demonizes people and that is utterly shocked, uh, you know, that thinks literally Hitler was elected in 2016, uh -huh. you know, is a little bit more nuanced than that. So can you talk to me? I don't know if it was, the, I think it was the mayor. It could have been the governor, but you said the mayor or the governor somehow balanced being both a Democrat and a pro-life, which I think I've almost met nobody like that in Los Angeles. So yeah, could you, can you tell us about that phenomenon uh, or how you perceive that? You know, Yeah, shout out to Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards. Uh, he's a Democrat who is pro-life. I think that's a phenomenon sort of unique to Louisiana because there are just so many Catholics here that you know, regardless of whether you're Republican or Democrat, abortion is not going to fly because you are a, a more conservative Catholic. And uh, <laughs> well, Joe Biden is uh, running for president of the United States, and I believe he affirms Catholicism in some sense. Conservative Catholic. I don't know what kind of Catholic Joe Biden is. I should not speak on that matter. <laughs> okay, go, go ahead. Well, um, 
Yeah, it's a fascinating thing. And I think you're right about those folks who grew up around conservatives or whose families were, were or are conservative and people who themselves may have been more classically conservative at one point, but who now maybe have a more broad or leftward perspective. I think those are the kinds of people who tend to have more nuance, not just because they don't want to demonize their families and acquaintances from the past and probably in their present, but also because they know better and they probably know in their transition from one kind of perspective to another, they probably did some reading and some introspection and realized that, you know, it's not so simple as, you know, certain political beliefs make you a bad person or an evil person. It's just often a differing of perspective. Now I'm not painting that picture with someone like perhaps Donald Trump, but mm -hmm. just saying in general that being a conservative doesn't, doesn't make you a bad person, even if you are wrong on a certain position or a certain, uh, uh, certain system of thinking. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the kind of thrust of things, people obsess, I think, about cancel culture, so I don't want to talk too much about it, but there is one more topic on that subject I want to pick your brain on, um, you know, before we come to a close here. Uh, but the idea of deplatforming, right, which is related to cancel culture, I think the idea is like, forget the free speech arguments, because that's about a government, it's not about people, and I'm more interested in the people than the actions of the government, you know? It, it seems that the basic idea is, and this is why I use the word like demonize, right? Or dehumanize. It's because it seems like this person is not worthy of discussion. All of or the majority of their views are so abhorrent. They're so evil. It's not even out of ignorance. They're so evil that they're not worthy of engaging in discussion. You can't have a friend of that perspective of that persuasion. You can't date somebody or court somebody of that persuasion. You you shouldn't even have a picture next to them. You know what I mean? I remember one of the most scandalous things. And again, I think George Bush was a war criminal. Uh, one of my favorite songs from Louisiana's finest Wheezy F Baby was called Georgia Bush, where I thought the he F was his most considerate. What'd you say? Forget the F around me. <laughs> a friendly. <laughs> I think it's Wheezy Friendly Baby. Uh, <laughs> so one of my favorite songs by him is not all the stuff where he raps about how he's on codeine and all these incoherent, you know, uh, like immediate rhymes, but where I thought his his sense of indignation and righteous anger for his homeland of Nolens, the lost city of New Orleans, as he calls it on the track, came out, right? At the same time, I thought it was silly when people were trying to cancel Ellen because she was in a picture with George Bush at some sporting event because they had mutual friends and the fact that she was even in a picture and would smile next to him, you know, made her cancelable. And now she had other, other accusations against her about how she treats her, her staff underneath her. I don't know enough about that, but I just, I just see like, again, the juxtaposition of pro-life Democrat, it almost does not compute. You know, I'm a Los Angelino born and raised. I spent some time in Merced in Central California, in Grand Forks, North Dakota, in Washington, D.C. And if you talk about all the times I've been in Ethiopia through visiting, it will rack up to two years plus. So I've had time outside of L.A., but most of my being is in L.A. So that idea and the fact that you are around different cats like that is is interesting to me. So that's all I was trying to let me, get let out me of make it because I think the kinds of people we were talking about before, like the the girl at the Atlant girl, <laughs> the woman at the Atlantic, who may or may not be Emma Green. Um, yes, yes, Emma Green. That's it. Thank you. God bless you. I try. Um, people like her. People like Governor Bill Edwards. That's one kind of person who who can be a member of a certain coalition while having views that are not common to that coalition probably because of past experiences and their ability to hold that juxtaposition within themselves. Like, I respect those people. We've got a different kind of person when we're talking about, say, George W. Bush and Ellen. And I think part of the reason that those kinds of people get far more flack concerning cancellation is because they put on a certain kind of front. 
as if they were one thing when in fact they are another when you really like look at that. who they are. John Bell like Edwards that. isn't the fact that he's pro-life. He's very open about the fact that he's a pro-life Democrat. George W. Bush was not open about the fact that he would be friendly with, say, an Ellen DeGeneres. Ellen DeGeneres is not open about the fact that she would be friendly with a George W. That's Bush. Real. They I like certain that. For their own personal career objectives. Mm -hmm. There's no way George Bush could present himself as... They played into partisanship. Yeah, they had to. And, and Ellen, in her capacity as whatever she is now, still <laughs> does that because that's, that's part of her job description. It's a part of her personal upkeep. And it's problematic because in those moments when we do see who they really are, they're the first ones to get upset. And when we, you know, point out just facts, like you saying George Bush is a war criminal, like that'll get people up in arms immediately in his defense, despite the fact that it's not at all, you know, really debatable. Like we know what this man did. And yet, you know, there's like this, there's a certain facade we would like to keep up about these people and that they would like to keep up about themselves. And those are the people that really strike me as problematic. I agree, I love that. So related to this, but in a different category, I have a theory, I could be wrong. I will keep my scientific and epistemic humility, um, meaning that if I am proved wrong in the future, I am happy to be corrected, but I will theorize that I may be friends with and know the first Catholic priest to dunk, at least publicly, <laughs> one day. We will see about that. And in that vein, I want to talk about basketball, which is something Nathaniel and I, uh, again, we talked about the intellectual settings that we were in. One of my common themes in this show is a hatred for compartmentalization and dualism, which is a platonic idea where people try to separate the mind from the body. I like doing things that are physical and I like doing things that are so-called mind or intellectual. I think it's beautiful that Nate and I got to know each other through intellectual and spiritual conversations, but it's no less beautiful that we got to know each other playing basketball on the courts. And you know, th those are not lesser than, those are both parts of our identity that I think we're both proud and, and unashamed of. And I can't say that I've always had that mentality that I think I did at one point buy into that platonic dualism or that the kind of fake dichotomy and binary people make to try to separate what they consider high culture from low culture. And within that law, uh, that universe of basketball, Greg Popovich got, uh, caught some flat recently and you and I were chopping it up with some of our brothers. Can you talk to us about that situation? And let's imagine a hypothetical where he were to say, Nate, give me advice. How would you advise him? <laughs> Lord Jesus. Um, <laughs> first, let me say that um, the reason I reject the dichotomy is because for me, basketball is an intellectual pursuit. That's part of the reason why you can't meet me. That's why you can't guard me is because I approach the game intellectually and critically. And uh, and I just yeah. want the record to show he's saying you generally. He is not talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. But uh, concerning Coach Gregory Popovich, I, I would... <laughs> I would have told him, lay aside whatever personal uh, opinions that you may have about- tell, tell the good folks first what, what exactly he got caught flack for in case they hadn't heard. During this NBA restart, they have been, there obviously was going to be some kneeling protests during the national anthem. And so far, everyone has knelt with the exception, to my knowledge, of two Spurs coaches being Greg Popovich and his assistant, Becky Hammond, and one player, two players actually, Jonathan Isaac for the Orlando Magic and Myers Leonard for the Portland Trailblazers. And they're probably standing for the obvious reasons. I know that Jonathan Isaac and Myers Leonard were like just this general conservative <clears throat> MAGA patriotism. But for Greg Popovich and Becky Hammond, um, it's a little harder to place because they're not known for being MAGA type people. Greg Popovich most certainly is not that. And yet he stood for the anthem. Uh, most people think it's because he served in the military, uh, which would make sense even if I don't agree with it. But I would tell people like that, 
in that moment, lay aside your personal affinity for the for the anthem and for the flag and for what you envision as patriotism and just say i'm gonna be in solidarity with you know the 20 black people standing around me who are obviously trying to send a certain type of message like is this the place for you coach to to have your personal opinions and feelings and patriotism on display like it's fine if you feel that way. Obviously, you're gonna feel and believe that way, regardless of what you do during the, you know, couple minutes that this song plays. Why not just kneel anyway? Like, what are you losing by kneeling? And the answer is nothing. But for these people, they feel like they are in fact losing something, and it's problematic to me, especially for those people like Popovich, who goes to great lengths to present himself as, you know, this more woke, social justice concerned, Caucasian male individual. But in yeah, that, I want to quote what he says. He quote, quote yeah. says about the president of the United States, Donald Trump, you cannot believe anything that comes out of his mouth. Which is true. Like, it's true. This man spits facts in the interviews. So why in the heat of the moment do you want to stand apart? from black people and do the exact opposite of the thing that you know they're going to do. Like, it's not like it was a surprise they were gonna kneel. It was a surprise that he stood. Why Why did you decide to, to make this the place to make yourself look like a unicorn? Like, why? Why draw attention to yourself in that moment? And of course, when they ask him, he said, oh, it's a personal thing. Like, no, it's impossible for it to be the personal thing because you're he said national personal. television. <laughs> national television surrounded by you know, black people doing something other than what you're doing. Like, it's not personal at that point. It's personal in your head, but in the action, it's not personal at all. It's very public. And the personal uh, has become political. Yeah. And then we got to ask you about why you did this instead of using that time to talk about, you know, what the hell we need to fix in this country. So, and he loves to talk about that, but like, you know, he knew that question was going to come if he stood and yet he did it anyway. So, that's none of my business, though. That's not my ministry. But that that's is right. since you asked what I would that's say right. to him. That's right. And I appreciate I appreciate your two cents, which is why I did ask more your ministry, more of what is your uh, charism, your charisma or gift from God is singing. And we have it's incredible we went all this way. You you kind of gave us a few runs earlier, some hints at it, but you didn't do any sort of full ballad or anything like that. And uh, we didn't talk about, you know, how that might have changed when you are with the Protestant folk or the Orthodox or the Catholic. But since we've done this, I would love if you would conclude this lovely discussion of ours by giving us, if you could, any genuine taste of the black gospel expression within the Catholic Church. Are there any go to hymns or, or songs that spiritual songs that you could share with the people so they they can be transported into the world of black Catholicism? Uh, you know, pretty much any song that black Catholics sing at church is going to be found also in a black Protestant church. But since you asked about Greg Popovich, why not do right by, <laughs> by America with the, with the Negro national anthem, which I think they're also playing at these NBA games. I'm not sure, but yeah, it's called Lift Every Voice. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicings rise high as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea thank you, you so much brother nate it's been a pleasure we're gonna get you back on hey tiny desk concert next time <laughs>